Okay. So it looks like just about, we've probably got about a good number as expected who've been assigned. So we can probably get going. We've got to try to stick to the schedule even though we lost a few minutes. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you everyone for joining. And just a quick reminder to make sure that you're muted um, unless you wish to speak, but also please, Morning. please use the chat function um, whenever possible. That's especially makes it a lot easier to manage a group. Um, or you may raise your hand by choosing the reactions button at the bottom of your screen if you're signed in on the internet. And you could raise your hand and choose other reactions through the reactions button. Uh, the mute button is going to be in your top, or your, sorry, your lower left corner. Um, uh, there we go. Thumbs up. Great. Okay. So uh, first I'll introduce myself real quickly. I'm Stephanie Dalkey. I work with Brandy at the Environmental Finance Center at the University of Maryland. And uh, with me today, we have Mary, who's with the county, and she will be helping us out and also taking notes. And I believe we have... Who else? Don will be Don Hawkins Nixon, the associate director of uh, DOE Sustainability, will be joining us, and she's actually the floodplain manager for the county. Great. Yes. Thank you. Um, and we also have, uh, I believe, Dr. Henry Cole is one of the members of the Climate Commission for the county. Um, if anyone else is a commissioner, you might want to, you can identify yourself just so we know, but. Um, We've got a good group, we can answer some questions, but we especially are here to just listen to all of you, what's going on um, in your community and uh, what are your concerns, what are your ideas and what are your uh, thoughts about how we can um, implement climate adaptation with regards to flooding and stormwater and also green infrastructure, which I'll explain a little bit in a second. So um, I think we've got a good crowd. We'll get going. Um, so Mary, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, before we start the listening portion of this, um, I do wanna just remind you all, like we are, uh, this planning process has been going on for several months now, and now we're really looking to get as much input as we can from the community. Um, and so a big part of what we're expecting in terms of climate impacts has to do with more precipitation and especially more precipitation in shorter amounts of time, heavier storms. And that's putting a strain on our already strained infrastructure. And so we have been looking at also how to include nature-based solutions into our flood adaptation in the county and across the country. This is really becoming kind of the, the next thing to do is to find ways that nature can also help us achieve these uh, goals that we need to work on. And the nice thing is about both improving our, improving our resiliency to flooding, but also um, finding new ways to use nature, uh, not only for nature's sake, but for, for our sake, is that there are a lot of multiple benefits to using these approaches. So environmentally of course you know using nature to help reduce flooding also has a, the benefits of providing habitat and it improves water quality and it also the vegetation helps sequester carbon which helps us meet our greenhouse gas reduction goals there are a lot of human health benefits of not only trying to reduce the risk of flooding because that's a huge public safety concern of course because people can die in floods but also it improves uh, the health effects after flooding if, if people's homes haven't been flooded and flooding can be very stressful. So not only mentally, but financially. And so we want to avoid that. And then using green infrastructure such as trees or rain gardens and other ways to improve the amount of vegetation in a town or a county can also help us reduce the heat island effect, which will be the topic of our another breakout session in the second set of breakouts. So, and finally, I think some of the, the biggest uh, benefits of reducing our risk to flooding and also um, using green infrastructure 
to help reduce our risk to flooding is this helps us save money. It helps individuals save money, businesses and the county um, by not having quite as bad of a flooding impact because you've taken steps to lessen that. So. Hi, Stephanie, this is Mary. Um, how do you want to deal when someone is raising their hand? Do you want to get to the end or do you want to take questions as you go? How would you like to deal with this? So I we want to make this session about uh, hearing from people as opposed to us talking to them too much. So um, how, did, how did you want to deal with that? Yeah, let's take them as we go, um, as long as we can keep them brief, so. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute. Uh, I believe Stacy Hartwell was uh, first to uh, raise her hand. So if you'd like to speak up. Hi, so sorry to interrupt your presentation, Stephanie, and thank you so much for acknowledging me. I'm with the NAACP, um, Prince George's County Branch for Environmental and Climate Justice. And one of our communities, Eagle Harbor, has really been beleaguered with stormwater runoff as a result of what is happening with PEPCO and the power plant down there. And I hear about this forward thinking um, um, work that we're doing, but what remedies and solutions do we offer those communities already beleaguered and nearly, and and having an inordinate amount of problems um, as a result of stormwater um, runoff um, from these sort of um, these environmental polluters. Great, that, that's, a, that's a really great question. And we certainly have space to discuss that kind of thing as we get further on. So um, I've made a note and we'll be sure to talk about that. Okay, and it, we can even talk about it offline because I know that the mayor is very beleaguered. There are a lot of issues down there. So if not now, now in front of everyone, because I know you can't take everyone's concerns. You've got a lot of people on this, but maybe we can talk even offline about this because it's a real problem. Ms. Yeah. Hartwell, Thank you. Uh, this, this is Mary and we, Mary with uh, Prince George's County and Don Hawkins, our associate director is on here. Hi, and Mary and Don. Yes, <laughs> and I know that uh, Don is on Eagle Harbor right now. Um, you know, she's already given recommendations, and we can certainly would like very much to talk with you. I think it's a complicated uh, topic, and if we could talk about it after this meeting, I think you would get more from it because it is complex. I will send you my contact information in the chat, and I would love that. And of course, you know, Mayor Crudup would love to hear from you as well. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, Ms. Hartwell, um, we will. Uh, for your comments and questions on to our new acting director. That's on. good. That's good, too. Thank you so much. Yes. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but you know, you don't get a chance often to speak. So thank you. I really appreciate being recognized. And please forgive me to everyone else who could care less about Eagle Harbor, but it's a real problem. We all should be concerned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next person is Abigail uh, Resnick, I believe. I, I hope I said your name right. You had your, your hand raised. Um, yeah. Like, um, one thing that really concerns me, and this is about human health of flooding, like a lot of people are dependent on medical technology. And when flooding happens, patients can't get to dialysis or whatever. So not that this affects me, but you need to consider the cost of human health. And so many people have asthma that reducing exposure to more preventing flooding can be, a, can be a good thing. And some solutions to that would be like rain gardens, solar panels. Yes, thank you for that. And, and that's the reason for this evening. We need to hear what your challenges are. And as much as we think we know the challenges that flooding presents, we really need to hear that reinforcement for even those uh, concerns we have not even thought about. So thank you for bringing that forward. And one more thing. Okay. You know, um, oh, Abigail, I think you're muted if you're trying to say one more thing. Like, um, so okay. one more thing. One thing that's really important is like, I mean, you need to think about Abigail, this is, yeah. this, this is Mary, you have a lot of background. It's hard to hear you. So if we could come back to your question um, after you've gotten out of the background, that would be great. Okay. Okay. Actually, I think the background's coming from Dr. Henry Cole. because he's Oh, it is? Not on okay. mute. Okay. Doc, Dr. Cole, can you please mute? I muted him. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Abigail. Sorry about that. It's, it's not. 
me. <laughs> like, um, like, um, one thing that, like, you know, you need to plan for how to help people in a flood because a lot of people with disabilities are ignored when it comes to flooding. A lot of people with severe intellectual and developmental disabilities like would often be ignored when, when there's flooding. All right. Because yep. I mean, I'm trying to bring this up because there's a lot of disabled people that go to the art programs in PG and and like in the end of a flood, some would not be able to intellectually function. So they, they would need extra help. So that's a great point. Yeah. Uh, Vivian. There anyone? Okay. Um, so I want to make sure we we have time for everyone to uh, to contribute once we get into the discussion in a, in another minute here. Um, I see there's a couple of other hands raised. Um, is it okay if we just do a couple more slides then we get into the discussion? Sounds good. Do you want me to advance? Uh, yes, please. All right. So just real quickly, um, we we part of the the discussion here is just kind of recognizing what the county is already doing to to help alleviate flood risk and to also help invest in green infrastructure like trees and and rain gardens and green roofs. And so uh, just worth noting for, as kind of our baseline here, the county does have a floodplain management ordinance and an open space ordinance that kind of help protect these features from future development. Also the hazard mitigation plan that's done on a county level every five years is the, really the, one of the primary ways that flood risk is addressed and that helps link the county to federal money in the future. Um, whoops, can we go back one slide? Okay, and uh, just real quickly, the, I know that the, the county's comprehensive plan has a lot in there, especially having to do with green infrastructure and protecting our existing natural resources and investing in um, putting those in new places where they're also of strategic importance. But um, then the county council did just pass a resolution to have new flood studies done. And I'm sure um, the folks from the county here could answer those questions if you have them about some of these details. But I just wanted to highlight some of the, the plans and programs that are in place. And now we wanna hear from you all about how to, how to improve things going forward in this climate action plan. So I think a lot of folks are, are becoming more familiar now with some of these solutions that are happening now. Um, we're starting to see green stormwater projects everywhere. And so these are ways to collect stormwater, but they use more vegetation than kind of a, a concrete pond that perhaps we used to build a lot more of. So they have more trees, we might use rain barrels or rain gardens, and they, they end up being prettier too, a prettier way to handle our stormwater when it, we get a heavy rain. And then they have the, the double benefit of also providing shade and cooling and habitat and and protecting property values and things like that. Um, also worth noting that we're also really looking at how to, how to adjust our and adapt our infrastructure. So this is things like how our roads are built, how our culverts are sized so that they're safer for heavy downpours and don't wash out or fail. And then um, how do we size all of our rain gardens to accommodate future rainfall? So, um, there's new money coming in from the federal government, and so hopefully the county will be able to take advantage of that and in ways that also help advance climate adaptation priorities. So we can talk about some of those ideas later on. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the, the county has been, the Climate Action Commission has been convened for several months now, and they have been um, hearing from experts and looking at what the county's already done and what the county needs. And they've come up with these preliminary action recommendations. Uh -huh. And so this is kind of how do we get to this vision of a climate resilient Prince George's County. And so these are just the preliminary recommendations. And this is why we wanna get input from all of you um, on these preliminary recommendations. How can we improve these? And 
how can we get into the specific actions that the county should take in the next three to five years? So these first three action recommendations are uh, particularly focused on what the county itself should be doing on a government level. So they need to, the, the commission has come up with the recommendations that they need to reevaluate the standards they use to build stormwater infrastructure. And also how can they preserve existing flood retention capacity of things like floodplains or wetlands? And then um, making sure that high hazard dams are being handled properly and that we aren't subjecting anyone to, to greater risks by not addressing any issues with those dams. Um, next slide. And these, the, the second set of recommendations here, these are kind of more about the green infrastructure side and, and we're hoping that you all have a lot of ideas here. But this is kind of looking at how do we protect existing forests in the county because those provide us with a great service for slowing down flood water, cleaning the water, and also for habitat and cooling and greenhouse gas sequestration. And also how can we integrate more green infrastructure projects across the county for flood purposes. And so trying to be really strategic about where we put nature-based solutions. So not only they help with flooding in a, in a particular location, but they can also help with cooling or um, reduce heat island effects and beautify the neighborhood and things like that. So this is just a, the snapshot of what the commission has come up to now. And so now we wanna hear from you all. Um, what is your vision and what do you think that a successful program that's focused on flood resilience and green infrastructure is going to look like in the county? And so we just want to take a minute. We'll take a breath. I've been talking really fast and throwing all this stuff out there. And just think about who, who would be involved in this, what needs to happen, when should it happen, where and how. And so just take, take a minute. I'm gonna stop talking for a minute and just think about it. I think we can be ready to open up the, uh, the floor, um, Stephanie. Sure. Yep. Everyone have time to think and clear your head a little. Okay. So, so now we're going to really get into some discussion here. We've got, I believe, about 15 minutes left. So first we want to hear from you all, um, you know, visualize and envision what a good flood resilience and green infrastructure program would look like in the county. And um, do you want to, you know, put your thoughts in the chat box? type them into the chat, or if you'd like to share what you've envisioned, um, you can unmute yourself and and share a couple of minutes of your thoughts. Um, there were people that were actually, that had had their hand raised uh, prior to this, if we could uh, go in the order. Um, I think Abigail was the last to speak, but there were some other people that had their hands up prior to this. Anybody? Yes, yes. I, I did. Uh, Zelda. Uh, okay. Um, so in I I work in Berwyn Heights and I have lived near in in the area for 40 years or so. Uh, there are constant flooding problems. We are constantly trying to put out uh, deal with these issues. I and one question I have is when DPI approves a new home permit or a driveway permit in which of course permeable surface is paved over, do they come out and look at the site or do they just base their recommendation on existing plans? Um, because there, every time I see another project where permeable surface is paved over, that's one, you know, that's one less uh, bit of acreage that water can be absorbed into the ground. Um, conversely, trying to build a driveway in, with a permeable surface is not an easy task. So that's one aspect. The second issue is, I know there was a project in Beltsville that my organization was working on when I was with Crick, and um, we, 
it was a developer who wanted to expand his parking lot so his trucks could turn around. And what we found is that part of the property was actually remediated from somewhere else. And in the end, that plan appeared to have gotten approved anyway. So I think that any piece of property that's already a remediation of some other place should never, ever be allowed to be built on um, because it's already, um, it's already resolving a problem from somewhere else. There's just, you know, every inch that gets built on, that's one more inch that the water can't get through. Thank you. Okay. I, I had my hand up and I think uh, Henry Cole also did too. So um, I'm Maureen Fine from Bowie and um, my, I, I think all of these, uh, uh, all of these solutions that you're doing or uh, describing are excellent. However, the first and foremost thing that needs to be done is to stop destroying our natural areas and Unfortunately, I've been in Bowie for 36 years. I worked many years ago on a green infrastructure plan for Prince George's County. And um, we are still losing all, a lot of our green spaces and our trees. Citizens should not have to fight tooth and nail to the point of exhaustion to save every tree and every section of woods. Our lawmakers need to be totally educated on the importance, not just planting trees somewhere else. They, yes, that's important, but they have to stop destroying what we already have in preservation, number one. Um, so that's my, uh, that's my number one priority is to no net loss. And if something is already in preservation, like over at Bark, why are we putting a hundred and some acre built environment there? Okay, it doesn't belong there. It belongs in a smart growth area. So, thank you. I would just like to echo her, her sentiments and especially with the threat of SC Maglev that is gonna destroy hundreds of acres of green space in Prince George's County, all to the detriment of the county and with absolutely no benefit to the county. I would really like to know how our government is really um, combating these kind of issues. Yeah. So uh, I wanna pick up on the last two commenters. Um, this is not a, an issue that's separate from zoning or from the county council's uh, seemingly unstoppable desire to give developers special breaks, zoning exceptions, zoning amendments, et cetera, which no matter what good stuff we put into this plan, unless that changes, it will defeat the very plan that we're working on. Now, let me just say that this ties into uh, the whole agriculture, uh, open lands, uh, 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 green farming, because in the future, we may need, this county and the people in it may need to have locally grown food. Look what's happening in California and the West they're having worse and worse droughts and heat waves, destroying their uh, agricultural potential. Uh, it gets worse every year. We're fortunate here and we haven't been hit that hard, but we must preserve our rural lands because that may be the, the bread basket, the food basket for us in the future. So uh, I think we need to get the message loud and clear that something has to change in the way that the council uh, uh, does its zoning work and sticks to the plan. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Cole. Uh, next, uh, hand, if, if, next hand up, I believe, was it uh, Miriam? I believe. Uh, Her Herbert, Herbert, I think, was ready to go. Herbert. Okay, sorry about that. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll be very brief. This is very informative, and, and, and thank you for putting this on. 
Uh, I'm Herb Jones. I'm the president of the Italian North Area Civic Association. And we're dealing with the issue right now with respect to green space and um, uh, the cutting down in trees of our forest for school. I'm not gonna go into that detail because everybody has a different opinion, but some of your previous um, speakers talked about the government. And I think wholeheartedly we need a, a, a cultural change in government. A comprehensive, the comprehensive plan that you all talked about is very encouraging. But when I talk to my residents that every time there's a prediction for drop of rain, they have to get sandbags. Emotionally, I don't even know what that's about. I can't even relate to that if that were happening in my home. So when they see all this growth, they're not focused on growth. They're focused on county, what are you doing with this infrastructure issue or lack of, up, of upgraded infrastructure that's been going on for decades? I'm new in the area. I've been here three years. I come from Alexandria, Virginia, and I'm just surprised about the lack of attention to the infrastructure. And I hope and pray that with these federal infrastructure dollars coming in, that we put on a full court press to make sure we integrate it in any comprehensive plan to deal with infrastructure. Because none of this, from my point of view, will really work until we deal with our aging infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks, Herb. Um, I know uh, Layla, or is it Lila? I think your hand's it, been up a while. Is, it, okay. is, it is Layla. And I wanted to thank Mr. Jones for starting off on one of my areas of concerns. Um, first, we don't have the luxury of concentrating on any particular um, level of approach. We're going to have to multitask. And what I mean by that is we need county level solutions just as soon as possible when we're talking about our storm drains and how they're sized, how they function. But even more immediately, we need a way to respond to residents that every time it rains, they're existing in fear. And they've suffered such losses with the past September um, 10th flooding, we have to have some immediate responses for them. The other thing is, it's not going to be able to be solved by the county. Um, it will require, I would say, the technical assistance and approach for homeowners to group together when they're facing similar situations. When I look at um, some of the funding that is available for action on your own individual property, we need to have systems that allow three or four re um, residents to come together to address local grouped area solutions. And that's an extremely powerful way to do this. And to expand upon funding um, that allows any of the reimbursable grants, and I've heard of some funding, but to have more funding that allows this not to be just for people who can afford to pay up front and then get reimbursed under grants, we need to have mechanisms in place so that everybody can take care of this. The last thing that I would say is what to echo what other people have said, we too often are looking at the need to replace forest that has been cut down with little protection. And if individual communities haven't already stepped forward with, if you're gonna cut down a tree, you're gonna to need to plant a tree. Um, and what we're talking as far as, you know, the caliper and how to do that, we need to step into that territory because the losses that we're experiencing are pretty extraordinary. And to look to others who have suffered this loss and now have learned, you cannot allow clear cutting even on an individual property level. You have to make it so that you're requiring that trees are replaced in that same location of if it's a municipality, um, civic association area, other areas um, throughout, throughout the county. Thank you. Layla, and um, this is for others going forward, could uh, just share with us some ideas as to what that response to flooding would look like. What, what is it that you would need? What I would what I would say, and in my community, it is a little bit area because we're a municipality um, and we need to think of different solutions for unincorporated areas, but we need to know what are the situations these residents are facing. And I could tell you each, you know, each resident in our town, if that means that we're providing um, something as simple as a wet back, if that means that we're providing um, sandbag support or the inflate, you know, the, the bags that when water comes, they inflate that have that substances. Um, if we're doing something where they are on a list so that we know that they are a priority for pumping, 
um, to respond because people have had their homes devastated. The other thing is to look at these individual properties and prioritize them for individual flood planning. For example, are their downspouts leading away from their properties? Is there a way to do something there? There have been storm water, um, storm drain issues as well, and to really prioritize those. I keep finding that that, that that keeps getting sidetracked into political realms rather than what the residents need. And I'm pretty tired of that. I really want it to be focused on the, the residents that were most impacted in September 10th or for other communities that are most impacted every time there's a levy situation um, and really be working with them so that they don't have to be in this place. And so those multiple measures. Thank um, you, Leah. for the Thank properties. You. Thank you. Um, I'd like to give others. Yep, we're, we're just about out of time for this session. I don't know if, if they'll grant us a few more minutes because we got started late. Um, but actually, I wanted to just uh, scroll through a couple more slides to make sure we haven't. There's a couple pieces of the conversation we've touched on in some of, some of your comments, but I wanted to, yeah, stick on this slide for a moment. And we've talked a little bit about this already, and I'm glad, um, Abigail, thank you for bringing this up, kind of thinking about who's left out and who might be burdened by the, the uneven application of a solution or uneven access to a solution um, to reduce their risk of flooding or to recover from a flood or to be able mm. to plant trees. So um, I wanted us to, to see if we've got any comments that kind of get around these questions of how can we help um. make sure that the outcomes of this plan are implemented in an equitable manner. Um. One more thing, like um, I'd say that um, yeah, like a lot of people, like if there's a flood, would be unable to leave their homes if they don't have transportation. So you need to think about that, and, and or or if they're dependent on medical technology, for example, and people can lose um. Like if they lose critical medications in a flood, some people are dependent on critical medications. Yep, great, great points. I mean, I'm not trying to be rude or demanding. I'm just trying to be aware of this. Yep, that, that's why we're having this session. Thank you, Abigail. Um, I'd like to jump in. This is Melissa Daston. Okay, um, go ahead. Not necessarily about who benefits equitable outcomes, but just a couple of facts. I posted in the chat a bunch of ideas, so you can pull them from there. But I did a data poll on about three months ago, looking at what development was improved in 2019 and 2020 in PG County. We approved the loss of 41,116 acres. Mm. Now start thinking about that. And starting with that, um, I think it's really important that we start looking at halting development in areas that are flood prone. Uh, Mr. Jones talked about repairing the uh, existing infrastructure, but we also have to be a better steward of our planning. Um, right now the developers own everything and basically if the new county zoning map amendment goes through, it basically greenlights development for major developments as long as they fall in a certain category under their zone. It is automatically approved. So while we're talking about things to improve flooding, know that you have legislation facing you some point in this fiscal year in this county council, whether it's this year or next, that will be approving greenlighting total development across the county. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I think they're they're gonna whisk us back into the main session just in another minute here. I wanna recognize there's a couple of other folks who've had their hands raised virtually. Um, if you still have something that you'd like to say, we've just got a couple of minutes left. So I don't know, um, Takesha or Patrick, I think you all Hi. haven't been able to speak. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Mayor James from the town of Bladensburg and um, when you talk about who's burdened, 
um, I can tell you firsthand, the residents who live in the path of these culverts that are owned by the county and flow through towns or cities such as Bladensburg are definitely burdened. And as far as the question about having a successful re uh, flood resilience plan, it's critical to have regular maintenance of those culverts and channels. But also, I think we have to be a little more innovative and look at other technologies besides just concrete to figure out if there's some other material that they should be made out of as just another measure to reduce flooding um, as, as the waters rise and flow through neighborhoods such as our town. So um, just wanted to share that thought. Thank you, Mayor James. Um, Patrick? Yeah. Um... Patrick Coyne, Mayor of College Park. And um, I put my comments in the chat, so I'll just draw attention to that. Um, uh, but just generally speaking, I think we need to develop a strategy for each section of the watershed. And, and when, we re when we replace trees, it needs to be, if they can't, uh, I think even better than placing them in the same municipality is putting them in the same watershed upstream uh, so that they maintain, so that they address water quality and quantity um, uh, within the same watershed area. Um, but we, we need to, 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 to take a look at what resources we have to bear, what federal grants are available, and really harden, um, um, improve our, our water um, uh, infrastructure, um, both to, make, to, to improve the, reduce the, 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 the quantity of runoff, but also improve the quality. Um, and then I think my colleague, Miriam, had some words, too, if she's in the last 30 seconds that we have. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, this is Miriam Bader. I work for the City of College Park. I'm the senior planner. And so I'm in the trenches. I know the zoning ordinance and the zoning ordinance really needs to be changed. I'm not talking about the new zoning code because it still didn't change anything in terms of uh, floodplain or, you know, climate action plan or anything.